Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Blue Collar Sports Talk. July the 27th edition. To start off, I'm gonna go over who I think are some of the best backs in Husker history. We'll have some Husker news. And James and I will discuss the top NFL running backs. And now here's our show. Nebraska has had some amazing running backs. In the last 50 years, Nebraska has had three Heisman Trophy winners. One, Eric Crouch was essentially a running back. He was listed as a quarterback, but I mean, come on, the guy could run. Eric Crouch won the Heisman in 2001, and in 2001, Crouch had combined for over 2,500 yards with 18 rushing touchdowns and seven passing touchdowns. Mike Rozier won the Heisman in 1983. Mike was an amazing running back and ended his junior year leading the nation with a 7.8 yard per carry average. He amassed 2,148 yards rushing, 29 touchdowns. In 1983, Mike wasn't the only Husker getting Heisman votes. Turner Gill had over 2,000 yards of total offensive production that year. With over 1,500 yards passing and an additional 531 yards rushing with 11 touchdowns. Heisman vote getters that year included Turner Gill with the fourth most Heisman votes behind Steve Young and Doug Flutie. Oh, and of course his teammate, Mike Rogier, who won the Heisman that year. Now imagine having to share playing time with Mike Rogier. Roger Craig did just that and gained over a thousand yards rushing while sharing the same backfield with Rogier and a very talented Turner Gill. Roger Craig excelled under the coaching of Tom Osborne and had over a thousand yards in 1981. He finished his time at Nebraska with over 2,400 total yards and 16 touchdowns. Pretty solid stats. When you had teammates that you had to share the ball with like Irving Fryer, Turner Gill, Mike Rogier, and Tom Rathman. Now this brings us to the third Husker to win a Heisman in the last 50 years. Okay, last 50 plus years, Johnny Rogers. Now Johnny could be called a hybrid running back these days because he was equally dangerous as a running back, as a receiver, and as an elusive punt and kick returner. From 1970 to 1972, Johnny Rogers gave tacklers nightmares whenever he had the ball. In his three years at Nebraska, he averaged a little over 17 yards a reception and over 11 yards a carry. 1972, his final season at Nebraska, Johnny Rogers had over 1,000 yards receiving 348 yards rushing with 19 touchdowns. He also threw a touchdown on his only pass attempt in 1972. All right, let's look at this. After listing Rogier, Crouch, and Johnny Rogers as some of Nebraska's most electrifying players to run the ball, who should be listed next? True running backs? Maybe quarterbacks like Eric Crouch that run like elite running backs. Both? Okay, you talked me into it. I'll add both. We'll start with running backs, though. Any Husker running back list wouldn't be complete without mentioning Amon Green. As a freshman, Amon Green ran for over a 1,000 yards in his freshman season. His QB, you might have heard of him, Tommy Frazier. He also ran for over a 1,000 yards and threw for over a thousand yards. In 1995, Tommy Frazier was second in Heisman votes, only behind Eddie George of Ohio State by a mere 50 votes. Now, Green may owe some of his success, unfortunately, to some off-field issues of the late Lawrence Phillips. In 1994, Phillips rushed for over 1,700 yards. But 
In 1995, the next season, only played in five games. This allowed the freshman phenom Amon Green to showcase his talents and shine. All right, I've listed just a few backs. If we wanted to go all in, I mean a deep dive down the rabbit hole and go all in. We would have to mention Amir Abdullah, Roy Halu Jr., Rex Burkhead, Calvin Jones, a man with possibly the coolest name as a running back for Nebraska, I am hip. Baron Diedrich, Corey Ross. Okay, quarterbacks again? Sure, why not? Taylor Martinez and Jamal Lord, great runners. Also maybe tied for the coolest name of a running back was Jarvis Redwine, Derek Brown, maybe your Corell Buckhalter fan, maybe Keith Jones, Dan Alexander, Doug DeBose, Leotis Flowers, maybe you're a Damon Benning fan, maybe you're a fan of the brothers Joel and Jeff McAvicka. Whoever you are a fan of in the comments, why don't you list who are some of your favorite running backs of all time? Well, we better include James in the show, so let's get back to it. Hey, welcome everybody to another edition of Blue Collar Sports Talk. Daryl here with James, Thursday the 27th. Morning. James there. And uh, yeah, how about that list of Husker running backs we just heard about? Oh my gosh. The, uh, the great days of just watching. I mean... Amir Abdullah wasn't even that long ago, and watching them guys run, uh, I, I loved it. I mean, Lawrence Phillips, just, you know, a man among men type thing, or men, a man among boys, my bad. Yeah, I yeah, blew yeah. that, didn't I? No, good no, morning. it's all good. <laughs> good morning. I'm missing it's hot outside. Yeah, it is hot. It's Ooh. baked our brains, I feel. Oh. Um, I wanted to jump into Husker volleyball stuff for Husker News. Uh We've had some awesome stuff going on for the last, I'll say, as long as I can remember being a volleyball fan. Uh, be before Coach Cook, we had Terry Pettit, and, and we've just had an amazing time watching amazing players do amazing things on the court. So hats off to our administration on, on continuing that. And to help our current student-athletes, we have what's called NIL, name, image, likeness. Right. And I read about a $5 million donation that is to be spread over 10 years, and it's specifically for volleyball and women's sports. And I thought that's amazing that it's just for them. Yeah. I mean, something for them to look forward to, a great recruiting tool for sure. I mean, not that volleyball needed help, but maybe opens the doors for some uh, more basketball, more volleyball stars to get head our way. Yeah, the NIL, obviously, it's a legal way to pay athletes, which is great um, for them, you know, trying to go to school and live a life and have money to spend, I guess you could say. Yeah, I I don't know what the average is, but, I mean, there's there's some huge earners out there. Oh, my, yeah. That, that make a lot of money. Yep. So... I, I say great job on getting this done. And it, it was um, a couple of Nebraska businesses. It was the Nebraska Co uh, Crossing Outdoor Lifestyle Center. And then Just Data were the ones that made the the $5 million donation. So great, great job getting that to come to these, to these uh, deserving people uh, to get that money. Uh, along the same lines of the volleyball, or I should say keep keeping in, in, in line with volleyball, they are having a fan day, um, August 19th. It's the same day as the red-white game. Uh, I'm pretty sure the red-white tickets are all sold out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so if you have time Saturday from the morning of, let's see, 10 a.m. until noon, autograph tables will be set up on the concourse of the Devaney Center, and the doors open promptly at 10, right at 10. And unfortunately, no pictures, but you're able to have one thing autographed. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, people have ruined it for other people where you can usually get one or two, hey, sign this for my sister, my brother, or whatever, my mom. Now it's people, hey, can you sign these nine things for me? Really? You know, there's 2,500 people behind you. So, yeah, I'm. it sucks they limit to one thing, but I'm glad they do. Right. They say the, the north entrance is the only entrance that will be opened to help control people a little bit, uh, and all bags, if you do go, all bags will be checked at the entrance. 
So just make sure you don't bring anything crazy. It will be checked. Um, other Husker news. So we're inching ever so closer, ever so close to the start of the Husker football season. Um, football season, fun time around here, obviously. And Big Ten Media Days have kicked off. They started yesterday. Today is the Huskers Day, and I believe around 1 p.m. Eastern. That'd be noontime here. If you have access to Big Ten Network, they're carrying all the fun stuff. Matt Rule is going to give an opening statement. Now, last year, I don't know if you if you watched any of it, James. I did not, no. I didn't watch any of it either. I just read all the headlines because I was kind of over the Scott Frost era. And right. I, I, I think you. as everybody was, yeah. unfortunately. He didn't even give an opening statement. No. He didn't give an opening statement at all. And I'm pretty sure that is not going to be Coach Rule's M.O. He's up there with uh, Garden, Ethan Piper, linebacker Luke Reimer, and quarterback Jeff Sims. So this will be kind of the first big media platform day for Matt Rule as a part of the Husker team. So yep. if you want to catch that, I'm sure they'll be replaying that between oh, now yeah. and the start of the season. Yeah, Big Ten Network. Right. Um, and for us big fans, we're getting ready closer and closer. Today's the 27th, three days, July 30th. Uh, they start their fall, start fall camp uh, going into the season opener. And Matt Rule's going old school. I'm sure a lot of you guys that are finalists as close as we do uh, have noticed he's going to have all the players stay in the dorms. Uh, they got with the school and everything, got everything set up. No one gets to stay at home, including the coaches. So even the coaches for that's a 12, 14 day thing, they're going to hope to build a lot of team uh, camaraderie or whatever you yeah, want to call it. Yeah, rapport between yeah. everybody. Make sure everybody's on the same page. Yep. You know, getting up, eating together, talking, getting the routines, figuring each other out, you know, kind of forcing you to talk, you know, because I said, you know, you eat at your apartment with your two or three of you, then you get to practice and some guys you don't even mingle with. Here, if you're in that big breakfast room, you're sitting down together, joking, talking. Yeah, it. I'm all for it. I'm glad. You, I mean, why not? Why not? Nothing else has worked in the last how many years? Yeah, great team building. And can you imagine? Put yourself in Matt Rule's shoes right now. He has to undo not only the culture that was set in place by Scott Frost, but also a few of the other ones prior to that. And they, they, in my mind, got completely away from the winning culture. So you have your work cut out for you, Coach Rule, and can't wait to see what you're going to do. It, in, the same, in the same group of Husker news, we have to talk Michigan Wolverines head coach Jim Harbaugh for just a second. If, if you read any sports news, which I'm sure everybody does, um, he is looking at a four-game suspension, and it's because of recruiting violations. So if the suspension is put into place immediately, Harbaugh's first game back will be... The Big game red. against us. Yep, Big yeah. Red. Yep. A game here in Lincoln that's set for September 30th. I wanted to bring this up because I want to ask you, James. Suspensions for a coach, do you think it does anything? Um, <clears throat> in close games, yes. But looking at his schedule, the first four games they have aren't really any nail bite. Shouldn't be any kind of a nail-biting game. Their last one before us, I think, I believe is Rutgers, um, would be the closest. But no, I think... He's going to be there during the week because what I've read, he just isn't on the sideline for the games. Yeah. So that tells me he's there for preparation. He's there for the coaching, the practices. So you're getting the team ready. You tell the interim guy, hey, this is what we want to do. Look at this. And I'm not saying this is going to happen, but in today's technology of communicating, you can text all you want, right? Is it say he can't text the guy during the game, hey, look for blah, 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 or hey, so-and-so is doing blah, blah, blah. That's still coaching to me. To me, it'd be no communication, but he can text the offensive, defensive coordinator in the booth, get the message down to the guys on the field. So, yeah, no, these days, I do not believe a coach not on the sideline matters except time management, the timeouts and all that. 
And that's only if the game needs it. And like I said, I don't think those first four games depends on how good Rutgers comes in this year. See, you say text, and I think Bluetooth earpiece or whatever, whatever. Yeah. Yes. A, same. Guy, a guy in the booth, not on the sidelines, but, you know, offensive play caller or whoever he has up, upstairs, eye in the sky, watching everything. Yeah. I honestly don't think, unless you find them and hurt their wallet. Right. Yeah. I, uh, does he miss? Does he? Uh, yeah, I guess they they don't get game checks. There's straight salary. So. Yeah, I don't think any dollars have come out. And the school would probably pay it because it is kind of a silly violation. The main thing, I don't know if you guys are following it, but the main thing that happens during COVID, he had an extra recruiting thing that he shouldn't have done during the, the dead period where they were supposed to stay away from players. And they didn't. That didn't really, wasn't as, as grievous, but he lied to them. They went during the investigation. They interviewed him. He said A, B, and C, and it was actually D, E, F. And they were like, oh, so the main reason it's a four-game suspension for this violation, the, the minor violation that it is, is because he lied to them. So when you guys read it, go, oh, the coaches do worse. Yeah, you're right. But he lied during the investigation, and that's why he's getting suspended four games. And if you guys see why is it being called Hamburger Gate, at the time they visited and was doing their thing, he brought them in the stadium, he fed them hamburgers, school-supplied hamburgers, that's why it's being called Hamburger Gate because apparently we have to name things like this. I, I had no idea. Yeah, yeah it gives some sports writer a job. Right. Hey, let's call it Hamburger Gate. Right. Uh, looking at the Big Ten preseason, way too early. I shouldn't even say way too early. It, it's it's before the season. Um, no one's played yet. We don't know what's going to go on. But uh, top of the East, Cleveland.com put together a Big Ten preseason media poll. Michigan, no surprise. First, Ohio State second, Penn State third, Maryland fourth, Michigan State fifth, Rutgers sixth, Indiana seven. And then on the west side, Wisconsin being the top, Ohio, uh, Iowa second, Minnesota third, Illinois fourth, the Huskers fifth, the Purdue Boilermakers sixth, and Northwestern seventh. Um, I really want Matt Rule to surprise a lot of people, but when you have a really talented Illinois team coached by coached by Brent Bielema. And then Minnesota has always been good the last few years. Iowa is great, even though we beat them late last year. Wisconsin really hasn't fallen off, even though they've had a coach change. I, I like it. <clears throat> but I think Excuse we can, me. I think we can still, I think we can still surprise some people if we put it all together. Yeah, and I'm I'm glad uh, when Scott moved here, they were all hyping us to start winning out there and going to win the West. I believe his first or second year, they predicted us to win it. I'm glad that they see all the changes. You know, they call us the, like the sleeping dog right now. They don't know exactly what's going to come out, how much how much Matt Rule is going to impact it since the last few coaches obviously haven't. And I like that they put us down so that the players aren't going, oh, my gosh, look at this, we're going to be great, you know, Hey, let's prove them wrong. That's what we need right now is a chip on the shoulder. Let's go out there and prove them wrong. And I agree. I I I think the West is honestly wide open. Um, there's some turmoil right now in Minnesota with Fleck and some of his players. Obviously, Northwestern just lost their coach. Uh, but Wisconsin, Illinois, Iowa, always going to be there. So the four that to me, the three that we have to look to beat to get ahead of would be those. The other teams, I'm not really worried about. Even Purdue, I'm not. But yeah, Wisconsin, Illinois, they they play us tough no matter what. And we already know what Iowa does when they play us. So yeah, those I, I think it comes down to those four teams. Obviously, Nebraska, Iowa, Illinois, Wisconsin. And now uh, you can flip a coin, I guess, for right now until we start playing games and see what we got. Um, staying on the same football topic, we are going to switch gears to the NFL. Uh, <clears throat> last week, James and I had went over some of the the previous quarterbacks in NFL history who we thought might do really well in this upcoming, and not this upcoming, in, in this league that we have going on right now, which is really more focused on the pass and the run. Yeah. Guys that were ahead of their time, per, per se. Yeah. Um, and, and this, <coughs> this kind of got, got started. James and I have, have gone back and forth over a, a few running backs and 
most notably on this show, we talked Saquon Barkley at length. He recently signed, and a few other things have happened since the last time we talked. Yeah, he he got his he got his one year deal. He did. He got yeah. his one year deal. I had mentioned, hey, why not pay him? I think what roughly Derrick Henry got, and I think he got there w- with uh, close with his signing bonus and the incentives. Right. And and I think that's kind of what he wanted. He he made a little concession just so he could be with the team. And he's always said, I'm I'm a team guy. Right. Right. So when he said he was he was willing to sit out the whole season, I really didn't believe it. Yeah, well, then they, you know, once you get past that deadline, though, you can only sign him to a one-year deal. So he's essentially playing on a franchise tag. It's just a glorified tag because it's still only one year, but he is making a little bit more than what the... Franchise the, allowed yeah, for, the, yeah. Yeah, the tag, so... And he, he didn't even put into his contract that they are not allowed to franchise him next year, so they could right. still franchise they, tag him again next yep. year. So. Yeah, and that's, I mean, to me, get 15. Saquon Barkley, if you hear me, we'll send you this cast, let you listen. <laughs> Your goal this year is to be 1,500 yards and healthy. No injuries, plays your 15, 16 games, whatever they do if they rest you or at the end of the season if you take a game off. Ball out and show them, hey, I'm not that old yet. I have this in me given a chance. And I, I honestly think it's going to be like last year where he's going to have limited carries, um, limited targets and he'll have another 12 1300 yard season and they'll be like you know everyone's doing that and honestly everyone is doing 12 1300 yard seasons you know so it's not even if i mean when you're leading the league and it's everyone's within 100 yards of each other it's like okay well no one's really separating themselves except obviously jacobs last year and the reason I wanted to bring this up, did you hear or read, see anything about how the running backs all got together as a collective and said, what can we do as running yes. backs to help? And then was it Nick Chubb or one of the running backs had come out and said, you know, right now there's nothing we can do. We're kind of stuck at the mercy of we are. the game. They are. They're right. stuck at the mercy. Well, not even, I'll say not even the game. They're stuck at the mercy of the owners. Right. Well, I mean, and, and it's a passing league. Well, but. Th- true, but also... Passing league, sure. Without having a good running back, it it makes you one dimensional, and and then they focus on just one thing. Where if you do have that run, and they they have to then cover two things. So the the reason I brought this up, uh, within the last twenty four hours, Colts owner Jim Irsay was mad that the running backs got together and called it inappropriate. Real, I totally missed that. Oh my gosh! So, yeah, it was it was a late article last night. I just happened to see it this morning, but to have an owner come out and the owners get together all the time, all the time, yes, to have him say that that is inappropriate. Well, why you do it all the time? You as owners get together, right? You set benchmarks of what they think is is a fair salary. I'll call it, or bonuses or what have you. Why I, can't why can't the players? Why is it inappropriate? Well, right. So they're a union, correct? Yes. There's a player union. So if the running backs get together, it's no different than us at work and one of the crafts have a meeting to talk about, I don't know, heat or the lack of screwdrivers. I don't know, whatever they want to talk about. That's within their right. Yeah. They have the right to get together as a position. I mean, obviously, it's being affected by them. Yeah, that's so. Ir- that Ir- is so weird, so, I, man. Yeah. So, Irsay is quoted as saying, "We've negotiated a CBA, collective bargaining agreement, that took years of effort and hard work and compromise and good faith by both sides. To say now that a specific player category wants another negotiation after the fact is inappropriate." Did they but that happens that? all the time. That happens. Okay, so what he is saying is inappropriate happens all the time on both sides. Oh. You come in, you renegotiate a contract. Okay, or say you say it's inappropriate. We can't do that. No, 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 but I need you to take a pay cut. No, 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 it's inappropriate, or say you said we can't do that. All right. So, again, it, it's a marketing tool that the media is pushing for the owners, which I think is a load of crap. Yeah. But... <clears throat> 
we we could talk pay all day long and not really oh, get anywhere. Goodness. So, so right, yeah. So, so back to forward, the running backs. So back to right. the running backs. Yeah. We're talking about amazing running backs, and this isn't necessarily a list of like, oh my gosh, who are the top ones? Okay, you could go it, and list yes. from the top down who has the most yards yeah. ever. My my, I have a a five. My uh, honorable mention five could be someone else's top five, and I couldn't argue. You know. Yeah, this isn't an arguing point between <clears throat> right. me and and Jesus. This is yeah. more like, hey. I watched this guy. He's awesome. I, I loved him. I yeah. loved watching him. So this is where we're at. Yep. Uh, I'll start at the bottom of my list. And he was a game changer to the league. I think he he started the door opening to the passing league. He was on the uh, greatest show on turf, shall you say, to where, and I get it. Yeah, you guys will know. Ricky Waters caught a lot of passes out of the backfield for the 49ers. Uh uh, the guy from the Philly, I can't think of his name right now. Same thing. But Marshall Falk, when him and Kurt Warner got together, uh, it was a game changer. And it goes back to what Daryl said. When a team says you're one-dimensional, they just focus on that one thing. So Kurt Warner, you know, if the box was stacked, I'm calling the pass play. You know, if they were playing back looking for the thing, I'm going to hand it off to Marshall. And oh, by the way, if I play action and no, the linebacker doesn't get out there in time, I'm just going to flip it over to him. Uh, so Marshall Falk would be my number five. There's so many people I wanted to put on there. 176 games, 1,200 yards with a four-yard average. Uh, to me, one of my things when I was picking my players was longevity, staying healthy, being there when the team needed them. Um, so most of the guys I had picked on my list were there for, a re- were running backs for a long time in the league. So, and, uh, Marsh Falk obviously has a Super Bowl, so that's huge. So that year he won a Super Bowl, he had over 2,100 yards. Of total offense, right. Of total yep. offense. Fact. 300, 340 receiving, and the rest was running. The guy was just money. Yes. Yeah. Great hands, yeah. He's one of those backs they started, oh, man, we can need a back out of the backfield that has great hands. And obviously ran, he ran amazing. So he finished a couple of years with zero fumbles, all right? Zero fumbles. The year they won the Super Bowl, I think it was like three. The year prior, it was zero. The guy never put it on the turf. I, I shouldn't say never. Rarely put right. it on the turf. Fact. Great Fact. running back. Yeah. Um, I really don't have them listed in an order. I just have them kind of all over the place. And for me, and I think you also have this individual as well, Adrian Peterson. Yes. As a Vikings fan, I went back and forth between him and another running back that made me fall in love with football video games. <laughs> um, so, but I, I went with Adrian Peterson. I'm going to stay on top of here. I went with Adrian Peterson. In eight seasons, he had over 1,000 yards. Eight seasons, over 1,000 yards. 2007, won Rookie of the Year won the MVP in 2012 with over 2,200 combined yards. He had a season with over 2,000-plus rushing yards. And won that, he had a six-yard average. Yeah. He had 31 less carries than Dickerson when he broke the record. So you give him that ball 31 more times, and he probably beats Dickerson's record for most rushing yards in the season we're talking about. But, yeah, an amazing all 16 games, a six-yard average in the NFL at, and during the 2012, which very, very impressive. Yeah. 126 touchdowns. Yeah, I don't, you can't say enough good things about it. And if you wanted a guy on your team that you could give the ball to and knew that he was going to just get it done for you, yeah. Adrian Peterson, and, just, just amazing. Yeah, from rookie year on, if you take out the years that he got hurt <clears throat> and missed, the, the whole season, he had double-digit touchdowns every season of his career that he played uh, at least, you know, majority of the season. He obviously tore his ACL, had three games, he had only four games in New Orleans, and then in Arizona he only played like six games. But all the rest where he got at least 10 games under his belt, he had double-digit touchdowns, including 18 touchdowns in uh, 2009. Out of, of uh, only playing and played, obviously played all 16 games that year. So 
he also had six career 200-yard rushing games. I, I mean, that's nuts to yeah. have a, a 200-yard rushing game six times. And okay. he was teetering on the passing league. Can you name the two other players who did that? Six times, 200. Six times? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to say... One's a current player. Yeah, one, he's the Titans guy. Derrick Henry. Derrick Henry, thank you. And then the other would have to be... Uh, I'll give you a hint. He's been to prison. O.J. Simpson. Oh, my goodness. No, he wasn't on my... I wasn't going to say him. Oh, my goodness. Six times. Wow. Yeah, elite list. Uh, he didn't make my list. <laughs> I know it. I know it. So, and, and, But, again, amazing running back. Uh, like I said, 200 yards in a game is redunculous. Oh, it's it's insane. No matter what what error you played in, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, whatever, it just doesn't happen, obviously. No. You know? No, definitely not. All right, who's your next one? Uh, it was actually Adrian Peterson was next on my list, so uh, sliding in my third spot overall was a guy we talked about a little bit last week, um, Marcus Allen. 222 games played, over 3,000 attempts, he had 12,000 yards playing for the Raiders. Uh, my thing with Marcus Allen, he wasn't your James Brown, O.J. Simpson, Adrian Peterson build. He wasn't built like a Mack truck or anything like that. He was a very, almost like a wide receiver build to play for 220-some games primarily in the 80s, 90s time frame where it was, you know, out. I mean, these guys hit. There was actual tackles and people were getting blown up. Uh, Marcus Allen was amazing. Uh, <clears throat> again, he got, you know, Super Bowl MVP under his belt. He obviously was the face of the Raiders for a really long time. Uh, finished his career in KC, which, I mean, if I'm a Cowboys fan and Emmitt Smith but it finished his career with Philly, I would not be an Emmett Smith fan. I'm sorry. You can go wherever you want. You just don't go in the division. <laughs> and not only did he go, he went to Kansas City. Yeah. I mean, you, you could have got away with the Chargers maybe a little bit, but to go to KC from the Raiders, wow. So, but anyway, and uh, Marcus not, not only that, but to, to win a Super Bowl with them? Yeah. He, it, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, he came into the he came into the league in '82 and won, run, uh, he he won Rookie of the Year. Yeah, and only and played nine games, uh, and got off 700 yards, four yard average. So he was one of those. Okay, I think the Raiders are trying to figure out what they got because in the next the very next year, but it was combined thousand yards. It, oh, so, so that's guess, what yeah. that's what made him amazing because yeah. he was he was that dual threat because mm -hmm. he had. He had over a thousand yards combined, and receiving was like four hundred and some yards, and then rushing was almost seven hundred. So yep. the guy was money. Yeah, and I say he only started. He only started nine games. He played in all of them, but he wasn't their guy. And then the next year, they realized what they had, and yeah, went from he had a hundred more over a hundred more carries, reached a thousand yards the first year. He was the guy. So. In in that year, he won the Rookie of the Year. Um, he also was, uh, I want to say, third in voting for MVP. So Mark Mosley, the kicker for Washington Redskins, won it somehow. Right. Point scored. Yep, point scored. <laughs> Dan Fouts was second with the Chargers. Joe Theismann, fourth. And Danny White, the Cowboys, fifth. So in your rookie season, to be in the voting for MVP is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, back then it was the running backs got mentioned a lot in MVP. And then these days it's first four names are quarterbacks. Yeah. You know, so. So three seasons over a thousand plus rushing, six seasons with over 400 yards receiving. And his 84 season, he had over 700 yards receiving. Yeah. So when you say he was built like a receiver, that's true. He was 6'2". Yeah. And there's a lot of receivers in this league that are 6'2". Mm -hmm. There's not a whole lot of running backs anymore in this league that no. are 6'2". Yeah, and he ran. I mean, when you he's like, like, you know, again, like Debo Samuels. You know, you hand off to him, you're like, oh, my gosh, this guy is a running back in a receiver's body. 
So, yeah, the Raiders are smart using them both ways. So, my next one, Barry Sanders. Um, One of the few running backs who stuck with one team. And I feel for the guy. Uh, Why do I feel for the guy? Because he played for the Lions. Not, Not when the Lions were decent, not when the Lions were good. They were just horrible. Every year. Yeah. He also won Rookie of the Year in 89. He had 1,700-plus combined uh, combined yards, 14 touchdowns. A few years later in 94, he won Offensive Player of the Year with over 2,000 combined yards. In 97, he was co-MVP with Brett Favre, winning equal shares of the voting. And how, how, do, you, how do you get to be co-MVP? All right. Well, you have 2,000 yards rushing and another 300 yards receiving. That's how you do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and from the get-go was the man when he got there. He finished with a five-yard per carry average over yeah. 10 years. Yeah. And, you know, he's one of the ones that got a 2,000-yard season. His 97 season re- ran for 2,000 yards. Every season he played, it was a thousand plus yards. Of course, um, he. We all know we've seen the videos, right? Where he's getting the ball in the backfield, and there's already a guy shaking his hand, like I'm going to tackle you now. But then somehow he Houdini's, and he's getting past the line of scrimmage. I. Um, it. He made some of the most outlandish runs to where you're like I. I have no idea how that not only got a yard, but he got seven. Right. You know? He played 10 years in the league, and he made the Pro Bowl every year. Right. On a horrible, like you said, offensive line was terrible. No one was scared of their quarterback. It was, when you played Detroit Lions, you're like, all right, I need my best tacklers. Just corral him. And they even if they had the game plan going in, and he's, by the way, 1,400, 13, 15, 13, 11, 18, 15, 15, 2,000 yards, you can't corral that guy. No. The guy the guy was a workhorse as well. He he only missed a handful of games throughout his career. Yep. And in his 10 years, there were only three seasons where he didn't play in every game. And when, when I say he didn't play in every game, again, it's just a handful. It, right. It's less than, than 10 games that he missed. Yeah, the 93 season looks like it was his worst. Only had 11 games that year. Uh, I don't remember what injury it was or if it was a contract holdout. I've got nothing, but only three touchdowns that year. And that's the other thing. His touchdowns had to be outside. He couldn't have short touchdown runs because the line was so bad. So he didn't get to pad his stats with one two-yard run touchdowns. But he still made 1,000 yards that year. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, yeah, he only missed seven games his entire entire career. That's for as for as much work as the Lions put on him to seriously carry that team. Yeah. And the only reason he wasn't on my list is mainly is it's longevity. He only played 10 years. I wish he would have just went to a different team. I know he had the love for the Detroit and his fans, and he didn't want to do that. But he's like, I'm never going to win here, uh, but I'm not going to go play for someone else. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we missed out on probably Barry Sanders getting a ring with another team or... I'm a, how do you much better you can get than, you know, all those yards. But it would have been nice to see him on an average to above average team. It would have been nice. Exactly. So that was, that was my next question for you. What would he have done if you would have put him on, okay, from 89 to 98, the Cowboys, who had an amazing line. And during that time I mentioned, that timeline mm-hmm. I mentioned, they had three Super Bowl wins. And you could run downfield because no one was going to touch you because the 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 line, offensive line, made a hole big enough for me to walk through. Um, there was a lot of talk because there was one year they finally got him a fullback and he had a lead blocker, but he wasn't used to following him. So if you go all the way back to 89 and the Cowboys draft him and teach him ahead of time, you know, because in Oklahoma State, when he played, there was no fullback. It was straight, Barry, just do what you do. If he comes in the NFL and he's under Jimmy Johnson now is what we're talking, and he gets they get Barry instead of Emmett, and they show him how to follow the fullback to the hole or, you know, read the hole that's an actual hole. Yeah, dude, it 
it, it'd be unrealistic because uh, I'm thinking 1,800 yards a season. You know what I'm saying? I mean, and Dallas might have three Super Bowl. I'm sorry, four. I'm not quite sure because my thing, Barry, was just kind of, I don't, he didn't, like you said, he never had a hole, so it's hard to tell what he would do when there right. was actually good line. So it was that just his style that I got to dance. And a lot of blockers were like, okay, I don't know where you're going. I don't know which way to push this guy, you know? So, but yeah, maybe when he came into the league and they showed him, hey, this is how you go through, it'd been a lot different. Or put him on a team that had a good passing attack. Yeah. So, so you didn't know which was coming at you? Yeah. I, I, think, I think he'd be he, amazing in draw plays. Yeah. Yeah. Totally would have. All right. Who's your next guy? Well, the guy that you just said got lucky with the offensive line, uh, Emmett Smith. Oh, he it wasn't anything luck because right. of the offensive line. It helped him, it, right. but luck had nothing to do with it. No. Uh, yeah, you can't lead the league in rushing. Obviously, uh, everyone needs an offensive line. All these running backs with these things had, you know, average to above average offensive lines. Emmett Smith, uh, I have to put him on the list. I watched him play. Um, I watched him do things. He played an entire game with a separated shoulder. Um, he, between him and Troy, you can go back and forth who carried the team more to and through the playoffs and the Super Bowl. Um, longevity, I, we all know. He he was there every game. He sat out one year for two games. Dallas started 0-2 on a contract holdout. They're the first team to start off 0-2 and, and win a Super Bowl. And the only reason they lost those two, I believe, is, you know, Emmett was sitting out. Uh, Jones was trying to play the hard, hard ball, and uh, he lost. Uh, Emmett got his money, so that was huge. Uh, and he's another one, just like Barry. His rookie year, he only had 900 yards uh, rushing on a really bad Cowboys team in 90. But after that, it's pretty much 1,000-yard seasons every year until uh, his downslide, I guess you could say, his last three years in the league. Yeah, 1990, he won Rookie of the Year. Behind him, Jimmy Johnson, or I'm sorry, Johnny Johnson of Phoenix Cardinals uh, was a running back. Second in votes, Jeff George, third in votes. And, I, I mean, so 937 yards rushing, 228 yards receiving, a very solid rookie season. Yeah. Can't say enough good things about this guy. Two seasons with 1,700-plus yards. 11 seasons with 1,000-plus yards, three Super Bowls. Yeah, including one MVP. Uh, yeah, I, again, I know a lot of people play the offensive line card. Not, I'm not saying you. A lot of people oh, he wasn't that good. Anyone could have done it. Blah, blah. I'm like, no, I don't think anyone could have done it. Emmett was an amazing running back coming out of Florida. Uh, he showed you, don't, you can't lead the league in rushing only because of an offensive line. He had an over a four-yard average. 18,000 yards, by the way. 18,000 yards is not easy to get. Obviously, you see, because no one's coming up. Um, even Adrian Peterson, the great seasons he had, an amazing run. And uh, <laughs> it's my new Matthew Stafford is the Tennessee running back. Derrick Henry. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and I love Derrick Henry. Derrick Henry, I apologize. I, you're an amazing running back also who has great power, He's there every game, and yet he's not knocking on the door. So, yeah, you you got to give him his props. Yeah, if anybody doesn't say Emmett Smith is a, is a good running back, they're probably just mad that they're not a Cowboys fan. Is all. Mm -hmm. All right. Next up on my list, I have again. Mine isn't really in any order. I just threw them all together because I think all these guys, once you get to this this level, they're all just as good. Uh, Curtis Martin. So. Curtis Martin had 10 1,000-plus seasons, uh, 95 to 2005 with the Patriots, 95 to 97 with the Jets. And let's see, he won Rookie of the Year in 95. He had 1,700 combined rushing and receiving yards in his rookie year. All right, Terrell Davis was second in vote-getters for his rookie year. Third was Joey Galloway. And fourth, Cordell Stewart. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, 2004, he was fourth in votes for Offensive Player of the Year behind Peyton Manning, Dante Culpepper, and Terrell Owens. Yeah, 1,600 yards a game that season. 106-yard average or 12 touchdowns. So on a very 
not so good Jets team. That's very impressive. And I brought this up because how is Terrell Owens ahead of him? I mean, Owens had 1,200 yards receiving and 14 touchdowns. Martin had 1,800 combined yards and 14 yeah. touchdowns. Probably, I'm going to guess Terrell Owens' team was in the playoffs. Or <laughs> right, right. No, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the they're they're going to give them. They're going to give them the nod because they're better. So, right. but Curtis Martin can't say enough good things yeah. about Curtis Martin. The guy was just money. Didn't matter if he threw to him or, or handed the ball off to him. Yeah, and I, I'd be interested to know. I'd have to go back and look. Uh, that was young in my career as far as following sports, and I mainly stayed with the Cowboys, but. He was with New England for three years, and they got rid of him. And he was great then, 1,400 yards for him, 11-11. I know New England was kind of not necessarily irrelevant, but weren't great, but they were a decent team. I don't know why they'd give up a player this. Obviously, he had the potential to be such a great player, and obviously he was. I love Curtis Martin. Uh, he's one of my audible mentions. Uh, he was an amazing back, another one that caught out of the backfield, picked up the blitz showed up every day. Uh, yeah, I, I wonder what happened or what was the trade. Maybe New England got a quarterback or something. I don't know. For him to leave them like that was kind of a... I, I wonder what happened back then. Do you remember who the coach was in 97 for the Patriots? I had to look this up. No. Pete Carroll. Wow. Yeah. And he's a running guy. Yeah. That's odd. So, yeah. I, I, exactly. I found that interesting. So, I don't know if they got into a fight and then it's yeah. like, hey, well, this isn't working out. You need to go. I, Maybe I, a contract year and he wanted too much. I I don't know. Yeah. Again, I mean, he was there three years. Was that 35, 30, 3,700 yards rushing in three years as a rookie. And you, and you gave that up. Okay. Well, you know, the Jets appreciate you. The bad thing is he went to the Jets. I've seen the division, and, you know, they just weren't very good, and that's why Curtis Martin, a lot of people do not remember Curtis Martin as a running back. But if you're a fantasy football player playing, we knew to draft his butt in the first couple rounds. And Drew Bledsoe was the was the quarterback. Oh, yeah. So yep. it, it, I, I agree with you, James. Why would you get rid of Curtis Martin, and why would you send him to a rival, the Jets? So there, there had to have been some some sort of animosity, is my guess. Um, but moving forward, who's on to yours next uh, running back? My top one, and to me it was a I can't say no brainer, but no brainer for me. Good old sweetness. The only blemish on his career is that Mike Ditka didn't know he would want a rushing touchdown in the Super Bowl, which blows my mind. But yes, uh, Walter Payton is my greatest running back I'd enjoy to watch. I think if he was another one, if you were to take him off the Bears, uh, you know, his he started his years in 75. If he goes to the Cowboys, the Dolphins, or the Steelers in the 70s, we would be talking about Walter Payton. I mean, he finished with 1,600 yards. I don't think it's unfathom unfathomable. 16,000. 16,000, thank you. Uh, for him to have 18, if not 20,000 yards, if he goes to a team like that, like the Steelers, the Cowboys. And he always Cowboys, played hurt. Right? Yeah, that, yeah, he was uh, yeah, one of those guys that, you know what? No, my job is to be on the field. I'm going to be on the field. And for the Bears, he played numerous games. He didn't start until 1981 for them. He was like their backup. They had Gale Sayers, obviously. He carried the ball a lot. A thousand yard seasons until 82. He must have had an injury. He only had nine games. But for the most part, every year, just like Barry and Emmett, every year, a thousand yards, thousand yards, got it done quietly, didn't showboat, hand the ball to ref, walk over the sideline. Uh, not that the Bears were bad, but if he was on a team that Realize what they had. Oh, man, I, I just watching him run, it was almost like a mix of a Barry Sanders and um, Jim Brown into one. Or you could say Gale Sayers yeah, and Jim Brown. Truly was. Yeah, he helped the Bears win a Super Bowl in 85. They they just creamed the Patriots 46 to 10. They creamed the NFL that year. Do you know their only loss that season? Yeah, Miami Dolphins, Monday Night Football. Yeah. And... The Miami Dolphins weren't even good that year. Dan Marino, yeah. And they the funny thing is, Dan Marino and, and the, the Dolphins lost to the Patriots in yes, the playoffs. Right. 
So they're the, <laughs> the only ones. The Bears are like, oh, thank goodness. Yeah, and, yeah, <laughs> right. And they were the only ones that beat them that entire season, which yeah. I found funny. And I, I want to say they're double-digit favorites. I remember watching the game. And, again, people can say that it was rigged. That's another way the NFL fixed it and blah, blah, blah. And it was the last tough when they were looking at the schedule of, you know, trying to go undefeated, right? So the last, the only, not the last, the only undefeated team in the NFL was the Miami Dolphins, 72, correct? So here the Dolphins, barely a 500 team, were playing this juggernaut in the Chicago Bears. Bears come in in their swagger Hollywood style that they did. And the Miami's like, man, looking at the remaining of their schedule, we're like the biggest roadblock they have, or they're going to be undefeated like our Miami team. And they went out there and balled out. I mean, it was a good game. Um, I have no idea how Marino didn't get sacked nine times. It just, he just didn't. Uh, yeah, and they got it done shockingly to the NFL world. One of the biggest upsets, I believe, in my opinion. Okay, so that was your whole list? Yeah, I, 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 uh, I did, you did six. I, which, well, I cheated. Yeah. I have three more that I want to mention. <laughs> I, uh, let's see. We are, we're at the 50-minute mark. So at the, at the start of the show, I did a breakdown of, of some great Husker running backs, and I mentioned Amon Green as a great Husker yes. running back. So briefly, this is what he did in the NFL. Six 1,000-plus yard seasons, one 1,800-plus season, a year with over 2,000 combined yards, and a year with over 1,900 combined yards. And that's after he was a workhorse in college. Yeah. The guy was unstoppable. He, yep. he was, he's a truly great running back. The only problem early in his career was he had that sleeve on and he fumbled a lot uh, early. He ended up taking the sleeve off, I think, third season. Did a lot better. Yeah, he was he was another uh, fantasy stud where he got carries, he got numerous yards, and yeah, he was definitely somebody you had to account for every play. So in the grand scheme of things, if, if anybody knows the, the rushing leader list, Amon Green ranks 38th, so he doesn't even make it into the top 25. Right. But he, he was amazing at what he did, for what he did for, for Green Bay and everything that he could do. Another guy that I wanted to mention, Eric Dickerson. Eric Dickerson had seven seasons over 1,000 yards, two seasons over 1,800, and one season over 2,000. Four seasons with over 2,000 combined yards. He played for three teams, the Rams, Colts, and the Raiders. He was second in MVP votes three times. One being his rookie season. That season he won Rookie of the Year. He lost to Joe Theismann. And third was Dan Marino. So imagine being a rookie out there with Joe Theismann and Dan Marino. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Yeah. yeah. In, uh, in 84 MVP votes, he lost uh, to Dan Marino. Yeah. That was and, one of big, Dan's biggest years. And third was Walter Payton. Yeah. I think that 84 is when uh, Dan threw for that first guy 4,000 yards or whatever, too. And in 86, he lost the MVP to the Giants' Lawrence Taylor. <laughs> so, you never know who's going to win the MVP is the moral right. of that story. Right. Now, my last guy, he's kind of like Barry Sanders. He didn't play a very, very long career, right. but Terrell Davis. <sighs> amazing if you're a Broncos fan, you know who Terrell Davis is, all right? 46 TDs in his first four years for the Broncos from 95 to 98. Rest for over 6,400 yards. He had two years with over 2,000 combined yards rushing and receiving. Helped win back-to-back -back Super Bowls in 98 and 99 against Green Bay and Atlanta. He won Offensive Player of the Year twice. And in 1998, won MVP. That was the year he rushed over for over 2,000 yards and 23 total TDs. Yep. So he beat out two Vikings, Randy Moss and Randall Cunningham, and the Falcons running back, Jamal Anderson, for that MVP. Yep. Yeah, and one guy, uh, we didn't, it's not on our list, but if he could have played, uh, unfortunately had a, a season, a career-ending hip injury, but if Bo Jackson could have played at least 10 years like Barry or, you know, a, a decent amount of seasons in him, we, we talked, Bo Jackson would have been on both lists other than Adrian Peterson, I think. Bo Jackson could have been amazing. He's an honorable mention only because of 
I guess you can say the potential, but everybody watched when he ran. Oh my gosh, dude. It, he was the speed and the power was just unmatched. Right. Yeah. It was it, the guy was great. Yeah. So eight 2,000 yard rushers. I'm right. Sorry, eight, eight guys rushed for 2,000 yards in a season. Only one of them, not only won a Super Bowl, got their team to it. Seven guys didn't even get their guys to their, their team to the Super Bowl. Do you know the one guy that won it all of the eight? Go ahead. Terrell Davis. Yeah. The only one. So back to even current to where we're at now, when we talk about these guys, running, Eric Dickerson's won 2,000 yards, didn't have a, you know, I'm sorry, Super Bowl didn't get his team there. No, not even uh, close. Right. Travis Henry's another one. Uh, Char- uh, Charles Johnson, the other Tennessee running back, Chris Johnson. Uh, same thing. Numerous, like I said, eight times it's been done. Terrell Davis is the only one to run for 2,000 yards in 1998 and won the Super Bowl and won the MVP. Yeah, he was another one that was amazing and due to the injuries, shortened his career. But he's got, hey, he's got two rings on his fingers in that short career. Right. If you looked at the list and just went down, okay, who's the best rushing? Okay, so Emmett Smith has the most yards. Number two is Walter Payton. Three is Frank Gore, four, Barry Sanders, five, Adrian Peterson, six, Curtis Martin, seven, LaDalian Tomlinson, eight, Jerome Bettis, nine, Eric Dickerson, ten, Dorney, ten, Tony Dorsett. Ten, yep. And Dorsett is another one. I loved him. Uh, he didn't seem to be, I, I, don't wanna, I don't know how to say, it wasn't like dominant. You know, he's very got the job done type guy. But I think he benefited from the team he was on. Like I said, if you swap Dorsett and Walter Payton, uh, again, Cowboys probably win a couple more Super Bowls in that 70s. Yeah, and, and then the next 10, Jim Brown, Marshall Falk, Edron James, Marcus Allen, Franco Harris, Thurman Thomas, Fred Taylor, Stephen Jackson, John Riggins. In 21, I'm sorry, in 20 was Corey Dillon, again, on a horrible oh, Bengals fan. Yeah, yeah. Or Bagels fan. Bagels, Bagels team. Come on. <laughs> Those are words. To end around out the top 25, O.J. Simpson, LaShawn McCoy, Warwick Dunn, Ricky Waters, and Jamal Lewis. Yep. So we just, again, we just picked some guys that we really yep. enjoyed watching. Whenever they were on TV, we knew that they were going to give us a great performance and yep. just have fun watching what they do. You knew they were going to get the ball and the defense couldn't stop them. Right. Yeah. Uh, Frank Gore was another one I thought. Uh, is I think he's like a modern-day Curtis Martin. A lot of people don't think about him. Uh, Frank Gore had a nice, long, long career and very – he contributed every game. He's another one that was there, played numerous games, a lot of yards. I think Frank Gore would be on a lot of people's list, especially if you're a Niners fan, obviously. But, yeah, some of those guys, they just get overlooked, and then you mention their name on that list, and they're like, oh, my gosh, yeah, yeah, that guy. So, yeah, again – just who I thought, you know, were dominant backs that carried their team from the, the time that they were there. Right. We, we could probably turn this show into a, a seven-week series on some of the best running backs and go over oh, people man. like Willis McGahee, Terry Allen, Earl Campbell, Sean Alexander, you know, Priest Holmes. Yeah. I, I mean, the list oh, goes yeah. on and on and on. Christian Okoye, him yeah. and Mike Allstott, when they came in, the oh, my, making a fullback, a speedback. Another Broncos, Clinton Ooh, Portis, who, yes. who had issues, and then once his issues just escalated, just fell off. But yep. the dude still finished with 9,000, almost yep. 10,000 yards. Yep. Marshawn Lynch. I mean, seriously, Eddie George, Tiki Barber. So I'm mentioning these because if anybody's listening, like, well, you didn't mention this guy, like, Seriously. Yeah, we know they're out there. Yeah, we, we're we done. We know they're out there. We just, yeah. we don't have 17 shows to devote to running backs. I mean, we right. could. Yeah. We just didn't. So yeah. I apologize. Yeah, and if you want, in your comments, throw in a couple that you think that uh, you thought were on that list or give us your top five. Exactly. So final thoughts. Um, I, <laughs> so we got baseball going on and my uh, Yankees are not so good, so... I haven't really watched a whole lot on the baseball, but I did think it was interesting. 1947. So if you guys ever look at old mitts that they played with back in the day, they shared them, you know, the stories where they leave it on the base and the next guy comes out and picks up this glove that 
there's no padding. It's pretty much just an oversized hand. In 1947, not only was he a, he was a catcher, 148-game errorless streak, Yogi Berra for the Yankees in 1947. With that crappy <laughs> equipment that they had back then, he managed to go 148 games without an error as a catcher who passed balls and wild pitches that you're trying to make look good. Uh, and again, it, to me, one of the harder positions to play in baseball is catcher. 148 games in 1947 without an error is pretty impressive. And then uh, this isn't really sports sports, but if for skateboarders, Tony Hawk back in 1999. So if you're watching X Games type stuff, he landed the 900. Yeah. In 1999, a by 900. the way. A 900. A 900. And people are still trying to do it now. And this guy, without all the fancy stuff we have, uh, he did it a long time ago. Tony Hawk, great. Great skateboarder, obviously. Land of the nineteen, uh, land of the nine hundred. All right, so I have a trivia question for you. Uh oh. I mean, I mean this this is this is a way back. This is this is a crazy question. Uh oh. Who was the first president to throw out the ceremonial first pitch at a major league baseball game? Uh I'm gonna just. <sighs> I'll give you the year as a hint. Nineteen ten. Uh, that, <laughs> that didn't help. No, did it? didn't help. Because I was going to say Eisenhower, and no, obviously it wasn't him. 1910? William Howard Taft. Oh, that's a, that's a big man. Yeah, huge That's a man. whole lot of man. <laughs> yeah, and I, I wanted to bring this up because with sports, everything changes. And how, how do I want to illustrate that? Okay, the teams were the Washington Senators, all right? There's no team named the Senators in the MLB right now. No. And it was the Philadelphia Athletics, which has now turned into the o Oakland Athletics. Right. That that name has gone. So that was kind of where I was going. Everything changes. Yeah. I, you know, when my uh, senior year, I had a Washington Senators hat. But I bet it was hockey? No. Oh, it was, it, a it was baseball. baseball. Yep. They had a little old school. It was a... Red hat with the white. Oh, yeah. right on. It was pretty sweet. So that rolls me into my second trivia question because we're talking about changing names. Which team in the NFL was originally called the New York Titans? Ooh. This is definitely not the Tennessee. Save for the Oilers. I don't know. I, don't, the, I didn't even the, know. It's the Jets. They, they didn't really? move. Yeah, it's the Jets. They were originally called the New York Titans. Huh. They thought big of themselves back then. They really they? did. <laughs> they really did. I don't know if I ever was it. They weren't named that very long then. I don't know. I didn't. I didn't pull up how long they were named the Titans. I just. I found this trivia question and I found it interesting. Yeah, because uh, I don't ever remember. A, wow. Yeah. New York Titans. Ha. Huh, it's funny. One more NFL trivia question. I'm batting zero here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Think of the first Super Bowl halftime show. All right? Who was the headliner? Dude, I wasn't born. I know. I know. I know. But this 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 blew me away. It's not a singer. Barry, oh, it's, okay. It's, it's not, not a not singer. A singer. Oh, this boy. blew me away when I saw this. I'm like, you had David, a, you had a comedy act come in. Oh my. You had a comedy act come in and it was the Three Stooges. They were the they were the headliner for the first Super Bowl halftime show. Oh my show. goodness. That'd be amazing. <laughs> because back then music wasn't the thing. It was comedy was making their stay away yeah. in the scene. Three Stooges are huge. Man, that would be you imagine if you did that in a Super Bowl now. I know everybody wants to hear the newest album coming out. But if you get a Kevin Hart, David Chappelle, somebody come out there and do a 30, 35 minutes stand up, make in front of sports and football and fans. Oh, dude, that would be amazing. I think it would get higher rating than the actual music. You never know. I'm in. I'm calling him to get down. You'll be hearing from me. Just let you know. We got to talk about this comedy halftime show. I'm, I'm in. Okay. Who was the only team in the NFL to neither host or play in a Super Bowl? Ever? Ever. Uh, it's the Browns, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay, so you got one. So <laughs> this is the last one. And I'm sure you'll get it. The team that has lost, uh, yeah, the team that has lost the Super Bowl four consecutive times. 
Oh, yeah. And unfortunately, it was to the same division. The other trivia on that is they lost to the same division all four times. They lost to the Washington, they lost to the Giants, and they lost to the Cowboys twice. And that's the Buffalo Bills. That is the Buffalo Bills. Yeah. Unfortunately, they ran into the NFC East and was like, anybody else but the East, please. Can we can we buy, buy another vowel? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that does it for our show this week. Uh, unless you have any other parting thoughts. I'm good. All right. I'm Daryl. See you. That was James. Go watch some sports.